So my name is Michael McKeo. I'm a person in long-term recovery. Uh, my clean date is July 15th of 2016. I'm the regional manager for Oxford House in Florida. Um, and so for me, one of the biggest gifts Oxford House has given me uh, was to be able to learn, although it's still a learning process and I still have some things to work on, be, it, be able to learn to be a leader um, and to be of service and, and to, to be somebody that motivates and inspires others to, to want to do things and not being that person that is demanding and yelling and, and being a boss. And so hopefully um, I can uh, listen to this presentation today and get some more good information. And uh, firstly, we have Lisa Londano, who began, began her recovery journey at Oxford House Valley in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, and credits Oxford House with giving her the time tools, and safe space necessary to rebuild her life on a solid foundation for recovery. In her two years of Oxford House residency, she had multiple elected service positions in her house, chapter, and state association before moving out and becoming an active alumni as well as part-time outreach worker. Lisa started full-time employment with Oxford House in December 2017, serving in the capacity of outreach worker, senior outreach, and reentry coordinator. She was recently promoted to regional manager of South Carolina and Tennessee. Lisa is a certified peer support specialist and currently working on her bachelor's of social work at Columbia College. She did... She did have a video for us, but there seems to be some audiovisual problems. I won't blame anybody, but he's over there. Um, <laughs> and we can't play the sound, so I'm sure she can put it out there. We can get the video link for you all, for you all but uh, she's got a really great PowerPoint, and I'm sure you will learn a lot and uh, be able to ask some questions at the end. So. Well, hey everyone, my name is Lisa Landano. I'm a grateful woman in long-term recovery, which for me means I haven't had a moon or mood or mind-altering substance since October 10th, 2014. <laughs> so I'm kind of nervous. Like, I speak in front of people a good bit, but I always get nervous, and I always go back to that nugget of wisdom from high school public speaking, like picture everyone naked. It doesn't work. Um, the <laughs> Yeah, the only thing more nerve-wracking than speaking in front of 100 or 200 people is speaking in front of like 200 naked people. So don't do that. FYI, it does not work. Put your clothes back on. Um, so I have this really cool video um, that we're not going to watch and uh, a lot of notes on said cool video. Um, but get your phones out if you want to. Um, Brene Brown, I love her. She's amazing, yes. Um, so if you go on YouTube and just, you know, search bar Brene Brown Dare to Leave Lead, um, they've got lots of things. This was just a little five-minute cutie animated with the key points. But, um, you know, when you have some time, look at it, and hopefully you'll get something out of it. Brene, B-R-E-N-E, -E, last name Brown. And her book, from which the excerpts were coming from, is called Dare to Lead. But anything Brene Brown is pretty awesome. So just put her name in, yes. Who's my Brene Brown fan? I hear you. Yes, right? OK. So am I supposed to do things? Oh, see, right there. Um, OK. OK. So that, that was the video, so when you see that on YouTube. Okay, bosses versus leaders. Um, so as you see, two columns. One has the qualities of a boss, and one has the quality of a leader. And I know in our you know current pop culture, everybody's like, that's the boss, you know, like, that was a boss move, and I'm lady boss, you know. But in the world... <laughs> 
in the world of Oxford House, being a boss is not a good thing. Bossism is not a good thing. Leadership is what we're aiming for. So bosses, they give orders and expect others to obey. Uh, leaders trust the democratic process. So that democratic process, as you all know, being part of Oxford House, that's conversation. That's the sharing of ideas. That's the sharing of opinions. And at the end of the day, that's a vote. You know, the majority rules. So even if you're not part of the majority, you respect that the democratic process has taken place. And that respect of that democratic process is a true sign of a leader. Bosses instill fear and strive for control and dominance. Leaders motivate, empower, and support. So funny story, um, I had never mowed a lawn before I moved into Oxford House. <laughs> and it was my chore for the week, and I, I mowed the lawn, and I was proud of myself, you know? Like, it was a big lawn, you know? And um, the, the boss of the house, we did have a boss. Her name was Miss Ruthie. Um, she went after and remowed the lawn, you know? Um, yeah, it was just kind of like a passive-aggressive boss move, you know? But the thing is, <laughs> that could have been a teaching moment. Do you know what I'm saying? That could have been a teaching moment, a little bit of encouragement. Like, I realize that you're 38 years old and never have mowed a lawn before, and here's just some tips. And I appreciate your willingness, and you really put gas in the lawnmower correctly. You know, just something like that. When people are not doing their best, and when you see room for improvement, that's when the leadership part of you should come out, not the boss. Bosses are critical. Bosses see the worst in the situation. Leaders, however, you know, they make moments teachable. They encourage, they motivate, they empower, and they support. Bosses ignore input from others. My way or the highway. Um, my favorite in house meetings when you can you can tell the boss, well, I only get one vote, but you know, like I don't control anything, but let me spend the next 30 minutes telling you why my vote is this way and yours needs to be too. So uh, we all know that person, and you know, maybe we've been that person, but recovery in general and Oxford House specifically is about our evolution as people in recovery. And, and housemates and, and leaders. Uh, leaders, we've kind of covered this, we always remain teachable. Um, they say if you're the smartest person in a room, you need to find a new room, you know? And I, I absolutely agree with that. And if people call me the smartest person in the room, which doesn't happen often, I'm like, y'all need to find a new room. I'm like, I have so much left to learn, you know? Um, but leaders remain teachable. Okay, so this is the key points from the Dare to Lead video. Um, so just roll with me here. Um, leadership is not defined by power, st status, or titles. I love Oxford House, like I love it. Um, one of the things that I would have done differently if I was part of the crew in like 1975, the term president, you know, just I think in our culture that implies like, you're the boss, you know, the bossy boss, president. So I think, um, you know, with that elected leadership service position in a house, we need to make sure that we're setting the standard that the president is not the boss. You know, they lead by example. They run the weekly business meeting according to parliamentary procedures, the democratic process. So I think really that our house culture needs to be one where the president is, you know, just leading by example and running that weekly business meeting. You know, regardless of an elected service position or not, it's one vote, one voice per person. You know, if you have one week or one decade in Oxford House, your voice and your vote counts as much as the next person. And I think we really, as leaders, need to keep pushing that idea forward to the new folks. Um, leaders recognize the potential in others. Had Ruthie Andrews, you know, worked a little with me on that lawnmower thing, I could own my own landscaping company now. She didn't see my potential, you know? Uh, <laughs> leaders recognize the potential in others. It could be something as simple 
as a new house member is writing a grocery list, you know, I'm always like, oh, girl, you have nice handwriting. Have you ever thought about being the secretary, you know, or like nominating them for a chapter position as secretary just based on their hair? Like, secretaries need good handwriting, you know? So just little things with potential. Um, one of our speakers at the women's conference last night, she had mentioned that she was a good cook and baker in her interview. So they had her bake like 30 pies for a fundraiser, and that's how she got involved with service, you know? Um, leaders recognize potential and good qualities and talents in others and help bring those out. Um, leaders show courage, vulnerability, honesty, and integrity. That's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but that's just being a good human. You know, these things are qualities that good humans possess. And when we're working an honest recovery program, these are the things that are hopefully being excavated, you know, from ourselves. And the vulnerability part, well, all of it really, when I'm not being a good human, when my, when my character defects are coming out, I can stop. I can have that radical humility and say, you know what? I did not mean to say that, or I said that wrong, or I'm sorry. So um, a lot of that is very much tied into recovery about just being the best version of you possible. Um, leaders can admit when they don't have all the answers. Um, I know if you've been in a house for a while or a chapter, people want to know everything. And it's a nice little ego boost to know all the answers, but we don't. Um, and even beyond ego boost, I think a lot of us in recovery just have a natural, innate desire to help people. A lot of us go in the social work field, the peer support field, because we want to help others. Um, but helping others isn't always giving them the answers, it's supporting them and giving the tools to find their own answers. So I think that's a really important thing that the video said way better than I just did. But um, yeah, but we don't have all the answers. Uh, and sometimes I still, you know, fall victim to this. I'll have a, you know, a house member or a staff member call, lay out this whole problem, and my gears are turning, like, we're going to find a solution, we're going to do this, and I'm, like, halfway through this elaborate plan of fixing something, and I just stop. I was like, I really, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know. What do you think we should do? And then somebody else, what do you think we should do? And it kind of goes back to that sharing of opinions and ideas and back to that democratic process, even in personal communications. Um, leaders stick to their core values. This is sounding like I'm on a spaceship up here. Um, leaders stick to their core values, doing what is right rather than what is easy. Teaching the service positions, teaching the binders. I love going into the house. Full house, one guy has like all five binders, you know. Well, they just moved in, you know, it's just easier if I do it myself, or I'm gonna teach them, dude, they've been here like six months. <laughs> you know, doing what is right is teaching, training, passing it on, instilling, uh, you know, the roles, the, the value of each role, each vote, each voice, you know. Um, please don't have all the binders. You know, if you have a, if you have a warm body in the other chair, even if they haven't unpacked yet, teach them something. You know, um, so doing what is right is sometimes doing it. Is I mean, sorry, doing what's easy is sometimes doing it yourself. But in Oxford House, especially, that's not the right way. That's not the right thing. I like this. Leaders take off the armor of perfection. Um, that's something in the video. Um, we think we have to be perfect, you know, especially if we, I don't know, have the most clean time in the house or the most Oxford house time or we're the ones with the car or, you know, whatever. Um, we think we have to be perfect. Um, and I sometimes set myself for failure with perfection. I'm trying to get over it over the years, but I feel like I just did so many terrible things and I was just such a garbage human you know, that now I have to be the best at everything. You know, like the best student, the best mother, the best this, the best, you know. And it's not. Like, perfection is exhausting. Um, perfection builds walls with other people. Who wants to be friends with a perfect person? Like, I want my friends, I mean, maybe not train wrecks, but like mild fender benders. At least we know we have something in common, you know? So like taking off that armor of perfection really does help us um, have more authentic relationships as friends and as leadership in Oxford House. Um, leaders instill trust. There is an acronym used in the video called BRAVING. 
Uh, boundaries, reliability, accountability, vault, meaning that you can keep confidential what people are telling you. Integrity, non-judgment, and generosity. And I like this definition. Um, generosity is just the assumption that people are meeting you with the best of intentions. You know, go don't make people prove that they're a good person. Just assume that they're a good person, and hopefully they'll prove you right. Okay, boundaries. That was the first one. This is our last slide, and I'm gonna, you know, get keep it moving. Um, boundaries. They define what is and isn't okay. I mean, it's simple as that. Like what I will accept and what I will not tolerate. Boundaries are the key to self-love and the key to treating others with loving kindness. Lack of boundaries leads to resentment. Sometimes we feel like it's hard to set boundaries with people, like, please don't use my vanilla creamer. It's my favorite, you know? <laughs> or, you know, please don't use the dryer at midnight because my bedroom's right by the laundry room. Like, it's hard, we wanna be nice people, but those, the vanilla creamer and the late nights and all that, like those build resentments and resentments even among two people can make an entire house sick. So it's nice just to go ahead and set those with loving kindness and clarity ahead of time, set those boundaries. Nothing is sustainable without boundaries. Like every, it would just be anarchy, like a vanilla creamer stealing free for all, you know, if we, if we didn't set boundaries, you know. Um, and yeah, that, that's enough said about boundaries. But this is my favorite part, they pr protect connection. If I tell you ahead of time what works for me and what doesn't, how I will expect you to talk to me, to treat me, and then I listen to you tell me your boundaries, our friendship is good to go. Our communication is golden. You know, boundaries do protect connection. Um, and this is my favorite quote, um, I don't think it's, Brene Brown, I think I did this, but I can't remember. But anyway, uh, <laughs> bosses build walls and leaders set boundaries because that's the thing that's going to protect uh, the sanctity of your house, your friendships, your relationships, and your communication. So be a leader, set those boundaries, and thank you for being here. I appreciate y'all. So in the spirit of good leadership, I do need to take full responsibility for the video not playing properly. <laughs> it was not Tyler's fault. All right, so next we have Tyler Sykes. Tyler started his Oxford House journey at the East Ridge House in Chattanooga, Tennessee on June 6, 2016, where he found a heart of service in the Oxford House model. He became an outreach worker October 1st, 2017 and began opening Oxford houses throughout Chattanooga. He later became the reentry coordinator for Tennessee before moving to South Florida to help with the state's expansion. He is now the senior outreach coordinator for South Florida and has participated in helping over 40 houses. And as Tyler's supervisor, I do have to say that he truly does have a heart of service. So Tyler Sykes. All right. Good to see the video. The Navy SEALs are one of the highest performing organizations on the planet. And a former Navy SEAL was asked, who makes it through BUDS? Who makes it through the selection process to become a SEAL? And he said, I can't tell you who gets through, who makes it, but I can tell you the kind of people who don't make it. He said the star college athletes that never have been really tested to the core of their being, none of them make it through. He said the preening leaders who like to delegate everything, none of them make it through. He said the big tough guys that come in with huge muscles covered in tattoos and want to prove to everyone how tough they are, none of them make it through. He said some of the guys that make it through are skinny and scrawny. He said some of the guys who make it through, you will see them shivering out of fear. He said, but every single one of them who makes it through, when they're emotionally exhausted, when they're physically exhausted, some way, somehow, they're able to dig down deep inside themselves to find the energy to help the person next to them. Service. Service. Giving to another, having their back, is what makes the highest performing teams in the world. Not their strength and not their intelligence. It's their willingness to be there for each other. Thank you. 
So I was asked to speak about teamwork and I found that video and I thought it was quite interesting. He is talking about getting into the Navy SEALs and he goes through all that. And at the very end of that road was service to another person. Um, and are we not the best group of people to understand that same premise? Um, each and every one of you, there was a lot of time, effort, money, belief that was invested in you getting to this convention in the first place. There were people who were back home that were of service to you. Um, and we host this convention every single year to inspire people, to educate people, um, to give information that you can take back home with you to be of service to others and empower your chapters and individual houses. And like, we have a lot of um, cliche thing, sayings in Oxford House um, because we're like, democratically run, self-supporting. You know, it's not run by a single individual. And um, all that comes from service. The entire structure of Oxford House is created so that people are equals, that we're not pitted against one another. Um, a cliche saying, we can do together what we can never do alone. Anyone ever heard that? Wow. Right, yeah, so you identify. So talking about creating teamwork inside of an individual Oxford house, you have a president, a treasurer, a secretary, a chore coordinator, comptroller, housing services representative. And the absolute best Oxford houses I've ever lived in, and I've lived in quite a few of them, um, were the ones where the people understood that each one had a small responsibility, that there wasn't one person who was doing multiple positions they understood that the new member in the house was the most important to take the time to teach them and get them up to speed. Um, and, you know, all that comes from, like, also the best Oxford houses I've ever lived in. Um, people are actively participating in their recovery program. Like a 12-step program and the step work and the change that occurs and people's perception towards being of service to others and learning how to do that properly while placing boundaries, healthy boundaries, yeah. Um, it, it's amazing the difference between that and then houses that are not fully engaged in their recovery programs. And like the craziest thing, so how many people live in a very, very, very good Oxford house right now? Okay, and we might have, a few that are in a house that may have some challenges. Yeah. My personal, okay. So I'm going to tell you my personal experience, that East Ridge house that was in my bio that I moved into on June 6th of 2016. I moved in and the three people that had been living there for over a year moved out a week later. It, it was just me, another guy that had been there two months, and we started interviewing and accepting more people in there. And none of us knew what we were doing. Right? And then after we get through a few weeks, we're like, we're probably not doing this right. Like we had enough common sense to realize that that was probably occurring, right? And we picked up the binders in the house and we picked up the manual and we started reading and educating ourselves, right? So there was me, a guy named Kevin Klaus that moved in a day after me, another guy, Steve Rose, and another guy, Derek Guy. Four people that all moved in within two and a half weeks of each other. We got together, we educated ourselves, we started going to meetings together, we operated as a team. All of us are still sober today. That's it. Uh, and that's nothing short of a miracle, you know, but that's what Oxford House fosters throughout the nation. You have an opportunity to operate this house democratically together as a group make decisions and let the uh, group conscience speak and and go with it and move forward. Um, and it's just beautiful. Like I had lived in other uh, programs or halfway houses and things of that nature. And like it speaks about it in the uh, Oxford House Manual and also the convention program, the we versus them. Like, dude, it was what can I get away with, right? Like anyone else ever experienced that? Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, they're going to catch me. Well, I'm going to get away with it, and I'm going to do this, and blah, blah, blah. 
and uh, trying to be sneaky and it totally goes against like trying to be in recovery because you're participating in those old behaviors that whole time you're trying to get away with stuff when you've got a authority figure or whether it's real or imagined or whatever they're probably just there to really help us but we don't react that way um, and then in Oxford House all of a sudden it's a group of your peers and you get to take constructive criticism from someone you call a friend instead of someone who you perceive to be above you telling you what to do. And like, that was a major game changer for me. Like I could take Kevin or Steve or Derek telling me, Tyler, you're a week behind on your EES. You're gonna have to step up your game and pay two weeks next week. And I, I would actually sit back and I'd think about that. Whereas if it would have been like a house manager, I probably would have been like, no, I'm not gonna listen to you. But they were my friends. They were my brothers in recovery. Um, and then like on chapter and housing services committees, like when you open new houses and we've grown to over 3,300, the amount of teamwork that's required to successfully do that and fill vacancies and move furniture in, um, it's a joy to participate in. Have a lot of you participated in helping open a new house? Yes. Quite a few. Was it an enjoyable situation? Yeah, yeah it's amazing. I, I remember there was a gentleman named Marty Walker that told me the first house I moved to to help start, myself and Steve were the first residents of that house. And he said, Tyler, do you even realize this house you're moving to help start is going to save however many hundreds of people's lives for the next years that it's open? And that blew me away. Like, I never stepped back to think, you know, that I was on the ground floor of doing something that I deem so simple as moving to another house to help start it that was just going to carry a legacy for years for other people in the future. Like, I used to sleep under bridges, like, I, and I get to do stuff like this today? Like, it's just amazing. Um, so, don't want to take up too much time. Uh, thank you for being a participating audience, and I'll pass it on to the next person. Next up, we have Mr. Leif Plobe. He moved into Oxford House in Howard, uh, Oxford House Howard in Eugene, Oregon, October 11th of 2016. Moved in to CORE at Oxford House Balcom in October of 2018. Held multiple service positions on chapter and state levels. He was hired in February of 2019 as the Outreach for Southern Oregon. In September of 2021, he accepted the Senior Outreach position for the State of Oregon, and he is also a Certified Recovery Mentor. Leaf Plobe. So I had all these bullet points written down, and it's, it's like my uh, security blanket. And I was getting ready to come down here, and I show up, and I, the back of my vest isn't buckled and all these things. And, and my wife's out in the crowd. I'm not going to point at her, but she's right there. Um, um, uh, so uh, I was like, hey, I need you to buckle this thing and everything else. And I'm like, oh, and I left my notes upstairs, so you guys are just going to have to deal with me and God. You know, so um, um, I'm going to set my timer because I can talk forever. Um, uh, okay, okay. i got a little more time than I thought. So... I kind of do things backwards sometimes. I just want to say something really quick because, um, God, you guys are beautiful. You know, this is, this is a beautiful thing. You know what I mean? And if, how, many of is this, how many of you is this your first uh, convention? You know, I'm, I'm excited for you. I'm excited for you, you know. Um, uh, in, in June of 2016... Um, um, you know, I mean, and, and if for those of, some of you have heard my story, and I apologize because you're going to hear some things that I that I often say. Um, um, I used to tell people I was an outdoorsman, <clears throat> but the fact is I was homeless. <laughs> you know, and uh, <clears throat> and you know, I'm gonna tell you. You know, I mean, I, I I heard everything that I've heard so far today is great, and um, um, I was a boss when I was young. You know, I mean, I was a boss. You know what I mean? And, and uh, and, uh, it, it, and I ran on ego, and, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll catch up on this here in a second, but I mean, I really do believe the difference between being a leader 
and, and being a boss, like what we're talking about here, it boils down to run, you know, operating on ego or operating out of humility. You know what I mean? I think that if you boil it down to its simplest form, that's what we get, you know? And uh, um, when we operate on ego, which I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate to and things don't work out the way we had planned, you know, a couple things happen. You know, either we get mad and we break things and we puff up and we do stuff like that or, or we just implode, we fall apart because I mean, it's all on our shoulders. You know what I mean? Um, and uh, so June 11th, so I'm, I'm a man in long-term recovery. Um, uh, that means that I haven't found a reason to use any mind-altering substances since June 11th of 2016. Yeah. Um, and, and, and because of you guys, you know, there's, how many of you guys know what the three R's stand for? Okay, you know, one of those that I think is forgotten a lot in, in, uh, in Oxford House that I think needs to come back, and Tyler was just talking about, it's recovery. You know what I mean? It, it's recovery. I mean, that's the most important piece. That's why we're here. You know what I mean? That's it. You know what I mean? And, and uh, that's why we can, that's why the, those of us that are up here continue to do what we do. You know, I mean, it, it's, uh, it, it's a beautiful thing uh, to, watch, to watch people come in and um, watch the light come on, you know, and watch them become something beautiful. You know what I mean? Um, so... In 2016, like I was talking about, October, I moved into my first Oxford house. And I liked how she brought up the president thing because I walk into this house and there's this guy on the couch and he's like, we're not supposed to vape in here, he says, but he goes, I'm the president. You know, and I was like, I was like, oh, all right. You know, I mean, this is what we're doing, huh? You know, okay, all right. Um, I didn't know how things went, and, and, and not too long after that, the chapter that I was in deemed that house unhealthy, and, and everybody got asked to leave, you know. Uh, there was a few things that they had done, and I, I don't need to dig into all the details, but because I was brand new, they asked me if I would stay, so very similar situation to what Tyler was talking about. I had no idea what I was doing, and this chapter chair at the time, she said, for whatever reason, these couple guys in here that are, that are not that are not leaving, they look up to you. So how do you feel about corn in this house? I'm like, what the hell's that? You know, you know, what, what do we got to do? And so, um, I didn't, I, did, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, um, but I, I knew, you know, I, I had came far enough, uh, to know that I, that I did not want to go back to what I had, you know what I mean? And I knew that this was an opportunity to, to build and, and to become something more and to get something more. And so like I was talking about, um, the, the group of men that, that, that formed in that house after that, like I'm human, right? And uh, I still, sometimes my character defects flare up, you know, um, I mean, a lot of those, and I mean, we can get into the whole defects turn into assets and all that, which is all true. Uh, uh, but I mean, it was, sometimes the boss would come out, you know what I mean? And, and lucky for me, those men that I lived with would just, we'd sit down in our house meeting and be like, that's cute, <laughs> you know, that's, that's cute, you know? But you should probably take a look at that. And I mean, and because of that, you know, I'd get mad and stomp my feet and I might slam a door or whatever the case was, but I mean, things started changing for me, you know? And to me, to me that's leadership in, in um, uh, a year later, I might bounce around a little bit and I apologize, I don't have my bullet points. <laughs> um, uh, but in, in 2017, the chapter chair there in Eugene, Oregon, uh, she says, listen, she says, we're going to this world convention, right? She says, I want you to go. You know, at that time, I think I was the tra chapter treasurer, something like that. Um, and uh, so we go to Washington, D.C., right? And, um, um, you know, I mean, it, it keep in mind, I, you know, a, a, a little over a year before that, I was homeless. I mean, I had... I had I mean, you know, if you're sitting in this room, um, it wasn't because you were on a high road, you know. Um, um, so you guys know what I'm talking about, you know. And uh, um, I'm standing at the foot of the Lincoln Memorial, and I had a spiritual moment, you know what I mean? I could almost tear up right now talking about it. And uh, you guys gave that to me, you know what I mean? And so that's what I mean. For those of you who are here for your first time, there's going to be some fires lit that are going to stay lit, you know. And... Um, I um, mean, you get an opportunity to play a piece in something like, like that whole group, in my opinion, they, they, were, they were leaders, you know what I mean? Because I, the road I grew up on, I, was, I grew up in a biker household. I was in prison by the time I was 19. Um, um, I was the boss. So if you were the boss, we weren't going to get along. You know what I mean? And, and, you know, and, and it took guys that, that, were, that, were, that, that 
showed some humility and that got down into the dirt with me and that would, it would, that would have a conversation with me and show me that there was something much bigger, you know? And um, um, Oxford House gave me a foundation to, um, to pursue a program of recovery, build a relationship with something much bigger than myself, you know? And, and uh, um, because of that today, instead of living in a tent, I'm standing up here talking to you guys, you know what I mean? And that's, Wow, you know. Um, okay, I'm, st I'm still doing all right. Um, uh, so I, I did jot down a couple things while I'm on my phone while I was thinking. So, so here's here's a couple here's a couple exercises you could do now. Uh, if you're sitting in this room, uh, some of you probably have you know a, a decent amount of time. Some of you are probably fresh. Who's uh, who's got less than six months clean? Okay, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess without me giving a definition that you guys know what a toxic relationship is, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, all right, good, good. Um, so so here's, here's what I, you know, I mean, here's just some, some things that I was thinking about as far as, um, um, you know, leadership. Because, I mean, like I said, it boils down to ego and humility. Um, uh, it boils down to, I believe, like communication styles, whether you're going to be functional or whether you're going to, you know, puff your chest up. Because I knew two ways to communicate back in the day. It was either passive aggressive or it was aggressive. You know what I mean? And that was it. That was all you got. Um, um, like I talked about this morning, I was picking on my wife. Uh, um, I'm in this relationship today, right, where we coexist and we get to communicate. And I'm, I'm telling you what, you, you want to have, have a fun exercise. You, you try to bring bossism into a healthy relationship. <laughs> <laughs> that shit don't work out. <laughs> Sorry, you know what I mean. Um, um, you know, and and because and because of those men, and because of you guys, and because of these guys, you know what I mean, and because of the people that were before us, because of you know, God rest his soul, because of Paul Malloy, you know what I mean. Um, um, you guys taught me how to be able to share space with somebody and to be able to functionally communicate with somebody and how to be a teammate, you know, rather than a boss. And I still throw a fit. You know what I mean? I still get mad. Um, um, one, of the, one of the times that I, that I kind of knew that I was on the right track, I, was, I, was a st I had been hired. I was still living in the Balcom house. And uh, uh, I've, over the, over the course of my recovery, I became tidy. You know what I mean? All of a sudden, I like things a certain way, and I keep things clean. And, and these guys kept throwing the frickin' dish towel just wherever they wanted to, right? And it's behind the microwave. It's over here. It's over there. And so I wanted to make it a fine. I wanted, you know, I, I was mad about it. Oh, check it out, guys. This is ridiculous. We need to make this a fine. And once again, the group of guys that in the house that I was in, even though I was staff, were like, that's cute. <laughs> You know, and I mean that, and that told me something because I mean it's like these men. I was one of the only outreach workers that came to a staff training a few years back that had to bring a UA with me because my house said if I got rolled, I better UA. You know what I mean? And and, and I thought that was that was that was good. That's good stuff. You know, I, I was playing a part in something, um, um, and they kept and they and they. I get to be reminded on a on a daily basis. Um, um, from my wife, from you guys, from uh, from other staff members. Um, um, to keep myself humble, you know what I mean? Because when I, when I start struggling, when I start, when I start letting that boss uh, uh, mentality come back in, um, things just start falling apart, you know what I mean? And there are some, there are some people that, that, uh, that are CEOs of, of companies and whatnot, and, they, and they, probably, they, they operate that way, but I'm gonna tell you one thing too. There might be some successful people that run on self and that, um, that don't care about others, and they're not of service, like Tyler was talking about, but I, I would be willing to bet everything I got that those people are miserable. You know what I mean? Um, um, and if you're, if you're in this room, and for those of you guys that were all brand new, um, uh, and this is your first convention, um, you know, you get an opportunity to go back and, and you might not know, um, you might not know the influence that you have on the next new member that moves into your house. You might not realize the impact that you have on somebody that you run into at a meeting. You know what I mean? But the fact of the matter is, is that you are all playing pieces in each other's lives that, um, that can take somebody from a tent and put them up here behind a podium. You know what I mean? And, 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 and be able to speak to you guys like this. I'm still, it, it, blows, it blows my mind, you know, that um, 
um, this journey that we're on together, uh, it, 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 it's definitely, it, I don't want to start talking about uh, spirituality too much, but I mean, I'm a man in recovery and that means that I still today, I go to my meetings, I have a sponsor, I have a service position, I, you know, I do all those things. Um, um, and I mean, and, and, and like in this moment, I can look out and I mean, how many, how many, because you guys are in recovery, because you guys are here at this convention and because you guys decided to do something different with your lives, how many windows aren't going to be broken tonight? How many, how many wallets aren't going to be stolen? You know, how many people aren't going to get beat up? You know what I mean? Because, because we, we, we tend to make some really poor choices when we're, when we're out there. Um, uh, did, is that, pay? oh, it's right here. All right, I'll talk about this real quick. So how many of you guys have seen this? Okay, well, th for those of you who haven't, and, and there's some, I, I, when I was looking this up, I saw some, a little bit of controversy on the internet on, on whether or not this caption is 100% true or not. But even if it's not true, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's powerful. So um, what, they, what they say, the caption that comes with this picture is, um, would you guys think that the leader's the guy in the front? Good for you, good for you, that, that makes me smile. So it says the three in the front are old and sick, right? They walk in front to set the pace. It says the next five are, are, are some of the strongest. They protect the front from a side attack. The middle group is fully protected. The five behind them are also among the strongest. They protect the, ba the backside. The last wolf is the leader. He ensures that no one is left behind. He keeps the pack tight and on the same path. He is ready to run in any direction to protect his pack. And then it says, being a leader is not about being in front. It's about taking care of your team. You know? And then lastly, you know, uh, I think I'm quickly coming up on my 15 minutes. Um, uh, you know, here's, here's something. If, if you're not pursuing a program of recovery, give it some thought. I know there's multiple paths. I know that there's refuge recovery. There's 12-step programs. I found my, my path in Alcoholics Anonymous, although it was, it was um, m a many other things that brought me to my knees. Um, but you can, you can either, you know, I mean, when we when we don't find a reason to look at ourselves and to put ourselves in check and to keep ourselves right-sized and to, to find a way to, to operate out of humility, um, our default is to run on ego. And when we do that, you know, I mean, it leads to all those other things that I'd already talked about. So, I mean, uh, you, can, you can either make a decision to be part of something like this, or there's many other ways that you can help people and be of service to people. You know, you can inspire and you can put others first, you know, or you can, uh, you can operate yourself with self-will to death and break others down. And, and in my opinion, um, it's always been this way, but especially today, this world needs more people who are willing to inspire and willing to get down in the dirt and really, you know, I mean, the, the best way to be a leader is to jump in and just do it with them. You know what I mean? And uh, um, with that, I'll, I'll sit back down, walk, walk the talk. All right. Alrighty, next up we have Miss Jackie. Jackie Sledge began her recovery journey with Oxford House, New Jersey, residing at Oxford House Melody, Melody Lane and Oxford House Marion in 2013. Here she was able to learn the Oxford House model and build a foundation. In November of 2014, she re relocated to Wil Wilmington, North Carolina as an outreach worker to assist with expansion. In January 2021, Jackie packed up to leave the beach and moved to Wake County area to continue with expansion and training of the capital area. She was recently promoted to Senior Outreach Coordinator for Central Eastern North Carolina and is fortunate to work with almost 60 houses. She's also a certified peer recovery advocate and received her bachelor's from Rutgers University. Hi, y'all. It's still really trippy when someone reads your bio. Uh, <laughs> 
just because you're like, I don't know, for me, my brain sometimes likes to minimize my experiences, um, and I like to start harbor on the things that I've done wrong. Um, so to hear some of the things that you do right sometimes uh, is pretty cool. Um, so my name is Jackie. I'm a woman in long-term recovery. What that means for me is I have not found it necessary to use since May 22nd of 2013. Thank you. So how many of you, and this kind of follows up to what uh, Leaf was talking about, how many of you have been in Oxford House for six months or less? Okay. Yes, give them a round of applause. Absolutely. Um, and the reason I pointed out the six-month thing is simply because our terms are six-month terms, right? Um, so it goes along with this concept of teaching versus telling. Um, one of the things I learned uh, about when I came into Oxford House was that I had a voice. Um, and I kind of already knew, because I'm a little bit of an alpha female, but uh, I learned how to use my voice for good, uh, rather than to uh, use it for all the wrong ways that I had done previously. Um, but what I also learned is this ideology of teaching versus telling. And so when we talk about telling, we talk about giving people uh, information, right? And it's information without really any background knowledge. Um, there are these thoughts that I have, and I need to share them with you. All right? That's it. It has that, what we like to call, authoritative feel. And if you are anything like me, which I know you all are, is we have a little bit of a problem with that. Right? Uh, that's what we, at least I know that's what I love about Oxford House, was that I didn't have some authoritative figure coming in telling me what to do like this. Um, when we talk about teaching, we're talking about giving context to what you're talking about. We're talking about explaining the why and the how. So for me in my recovery, um, I participate in a 12-step program as well. Um, I'm a proud member of Narcotics Anonymous. So I'll just put that out here. Um, and I say that because when I first got into recovery, um, I'm, I don't do real well with people just telling me just to do. I need to understand the why, why it works, how it works. Um, and I really believe that doing that is really kind of a transfer of knowledge, right? It's a, having this information and transferring it to you so that you then can transfer it to the next person. Um, when we talk about teaching versus telling, if you have worked with me in my areas, I say this all the time. It's a lot of work in the beginning. It's a lot of work. I don't know about you guys, I remember my first day moving into Oxford House. Um, I was really fortunate enough to move into a house with some women who, who had some time and, and some experience. Uh, and they sat me down and we went over the house guidelines and we went over a new member packet. And uh, she even had me sit down with her and read them out loud, right? And I was thinking to myself, I am a grown woman. Why do I have to sit here and read this to you like I'm in like you know elementary school? And what I've learned over time is that everybody has different styles of learning, right? Um, some of us are auditory. We can hear it and we pick it up. Some of us need that hands-on experience. Some of us need the showing to, you know, to be able to see it. So everybody learns a little different. And part of the concept of leadership is adapting what you are trying to, the knowledge that you're trying to bring out to that person's style, right? Um, I've worked with Oxford Houses and I've been really, really blessed to work in a, a, a number of areas. And one of the coolest experiences that I've had is working with a member who moved into Oxford House and was unable to read. It's a challenge when we say, learn the manual, right? How do you learn the manual? Um, and so it's, it's building a bridge to gap that versus kind of pushing you out there on your own and saying, fend for yourself. Uh, we don't do good when we fend for ourselves. We do better when, and we thrive when we work together. Um, ultimately, this teaching versus telling 
concept really leads to training. If you keep going down the, the road of teaching, it leads to training. And what that is is that transfer of skill set. So this is that training part, right, where we say we've done it in houses, we've had this experiences, we have you know, held house positions, we've held positions in chapter, we've held positions in, on a state level. Now we are fortunate enough to work for Oxford House, and then we get to train. Really, really cool. Never thought that was going to happen either. Um, so the why. Why do we do this, right? What's the point of it? Um, well, number one, it helps us level the playing field, right? Uh, I am you and you are me. We say that in recovery all the time. So I want to make sure that we're playing on the level playing field, that I don't feel like I'm acting on ego. Um, it allows us to adapt to the different styles of learning. Um, it helps us learn how to be comfortable. Right? One of the coolest things that I experience when I'm working with houses, um, and different areas have different terminology for it, but we call it in my area, care and share. Um, and it's when we wrap up the house meeting, because house meetings is a business. We wrap up the business, and then we sit down, and we, we talk about how's everybody doing. Right? So this is the informal meeting after the meeting. Um, for someone uh, like myself, that might not be a big deal, but for someone who has a fear of speaking in front of other people, just letting you know I had a rough week, or I'm really struggling, um, or I had uh, someone pass away and it's affecting me, or I'm financially overwhelmed, and I don't know how to get past it, or I'm you know, sitting here with a bunch of anxiety, just to be able to share that with you is huge, especially when you first come into an Oxford house. Uh, I, I never thought that I would live with women and respect them. <laughs> and that, that's just my truth. I never thought that was gonna be a thing. I, and today, I have the utmost respect for women when I walk into a house. The utmost respect. Women and men, I walk into your house, I'm asking to come into your house, number one. It's not my house, it's yours, right? I'm asking. Thank God all my houses always want to feed me. Really excited about that. They love cooking. Um, but it's, you know, I'm not standing up talking about this is how you had to run a house meeting. No, I'm sitting down with you. I'm showing you. I'm leveling the playing field. Um, Lisa touched on this, and I think it is so important. It's that reminder is that the perfection is not the standard. I have a, a very um, clear-cut way that I like to do things, but that doesn't mean that's the only way to do things. And sometimes when we get in positions like president or comptroller or treasurer or chore coordinator, um, we think that our way is the only way. Well, no, that's our way. What you need to do is teach the Oxford House way. The model is what we need to be teaching, not my interpretation of the model. Two very different things. <laughs> um, one of the really uh, unique experiences I've had is uh, the how and the why, right? So we talk about the how and the why. I lived in a women's house in Wilmington, uh, North Carolina, and a young lady moved in. She was 21 years old. Um, she had been living on the street for almost two years consecutively. And uh, the chore coordinator had gone around and everybody's beds were made but hers. And so she was, they were ready to hit her with that fine, right? I, catching a fine. And I said, Holt, I said, is there a reason that you didn't, the bed's not made? And what I found out is that she had never learned how to make a bed. She had never learned how to make, this was the first time she had a bed in over two years. So it's learning these things about our, our brothers and sisters in our homes and then being willing to teach them so that they can teach the next person. 
So we, we learned how to make a bed, right? And then we learned how to wash our sheets, not with the other colors so that they stay the same color when they come out, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Little things like that. Um, giving your time is more important than anything else in Oxford House for me. Um, if I have to sit down and go over something with someone multiple times until it clicks, it's worth it. Yes, sometimes it is way easier, and you can raise your hand. How, mu how many times have you said, I'm just going to do it myself because I can just get it done much, much faster, <laughs> and it's, I know it's going to get done right, yeah. <laughs> right? But what we do is we participate in a missed opportunity. We rob someone of the experience that they need to continue to grow and thrive in their recovery. And I rob myself of the opportunity to continue to throw, thrive in my own recovery. Um, so one of the things that I like to do, Cynthia's in here, Tanya's in here. Um, <laughs> we just, uh, we're working with a house for restabilization and we sit down in the house meeting and everybody wants this concrete answer of yes or no. And I always say, well, what do you think? They hate that, <laughs> right? Because sometimes what we've learned in active addiction is that we don't like to take responsibility. Right. It's easier when someone else wants to just tell us what to do, um, but that's not where we grow. So the question is, well, what do you think we should do? Or what does the manual say? That, that question's the worst. People are just, just tell me. No, what does the manual say? Or how would you handle this? Um, it's that concept of getting you to, you know, we put this thing on quiet for quite some time in active addiction, and now we have to, you know, turn it back on again. And um, you have a unique opportunity to walk through these experiences with each other. I get a unique opportunity day in and day out to walk through experiences with people, the good and the bad, to go to someone's celebration when they're picking up 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, to celebrate a birthday that they never thought that they would ever hit because they thought that they might be dead, to watch someone graduate from a recovery court, to watch someone go to court and actually get their kids back to go back to school and get your degree and go to your graduation. Like, these are the things that we get to do when we stay in this process and we remain teachable. Um, for me, I always, like, some, when I, very early on, I, someone questioned me, they said, why don't you become a teacher? I said, well, I'm an outreach worker. That's just one of the many hats we wear, right? I'm in recovery. That's one of the many hats of recovery, It's teaching. It's this concept of teaching, right? Um, Kathleen, our CEO, who I learned an immense amount from, always says that when you call and you want to talk about a problem, you better have three solutions <laughs> when you call to talk about the problem, right? So the challenge always is, we know what the problems are. It's really easy. She broke curfew. You didn't clean the bathroom right. You left your clothes in the washer machine too long. Um, they left a fork in the sink. You didn't lock the door. Uh, you know, all these things. Okay, but what's the solution? And how do we teach you to consistently get into the solution? That's our jobs. I don't know about you guys, but I didn't, I'm not a probation officer. Although when I was little, I really thought I wanted to be one. Thank God that that dream did not come true. Uh, you know, I'm not a probation officer. I'm not a cop. I'm, I'm, I'm another person in recovery who's just trying to thrive, man, and, like, trying to be better than I was yesterday. So um, I always like to end with a quote. And oddly enough, the majority of us end it with a quote, which was real weird. Um, but I always like to end with a quote, and my quote for today is... The mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, and the great teacher inspires. Thanks, guys.
All right, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. I see hands are already shooting up. Uh, so anybody's dealing with these kind of issues in their house or their chapter, feel free. Uh, there's some good experience, strength, and hope up here. Hi, my name is Michaela. I am from Illinois. Um, so I was just uh, told that I, this would probably be a good one for me. Um, so the binder, I truly believe, is like my best friend um, in the house. And um, everyone tells me that like if you have a problem, the solution is in that or the manual. Um, so I'm having frustration with my house because we have people that have been there for um, like less time than me and then for like two and three years and have didn't even know that multiple manuals existed um, and haven't read the book at all. And so they come to me whenever they need to find something or want to know where something is. Um, but when it's a problem in the house and I express like that, okay, when I argue, my point is their thing that they say. I argue my point um, of this is what the book says because it's kind of hard to argue something in black and white that's typed out. Um, they kind of take it as that I'm writing it in as I'm saying it because it doesn't fit their argument of where I've gone wrong or what's going wrong in the house. So how to, I guess, get someone on the same understanding of that like, this is just what it is um, and that it's not an argument. So like trying not to come off as a boss but trying to instill that like, that this is just how it works in the house and has been working for years. So one of the really fun things that, and again, they're here so they can attest to this. Uh, one of the fun things we do at, at one of the houses that I work with is at the house meeting, we don't just read the traditions. Right? We started reading the manual from like the very first page. Um, and we've learned, even myself to this day, <laughs> uh, that there's a lot of valuable information outside of those nine traditions that are in our manuals. Um, and so I don't have the ability to convince anyone of anything. What I do have the ability is to continue to walk my 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 talk. <laughs> yes, walk my talk, um, and to make sure that I am abiding by what I need to abide by, and and sometimes not having the answer is the best answer you can have. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm gonna get back to. Hi, I'm Sunshine from New Jersey. Yes, and Sunshine from New Jersey! Hey! <laughs> all right. Um, first of all, I really love the fact that all of you, um, like at this meeting, have been through where I am, and I really couldn't like relate to all of you. And I just want to have two questions. One of them is for Tyler. I really want to know what was the name of that video with the Navy SEALs. I need to play that for a couple of people. And then the second one is, um, you guys are so amazing, and really you have inspired me. And um, I wanted to ask, what would be the like the best way to like grow into an outreach person? What would you recommend for someone who's living? In, a, in an Oxford house, like, what do you think? How do they walk the talk to grow into an outreach position? Get involved. You know, j jump in at a chapter level. You know, first, you know, d d participate in your house, but but get involved on the on the. There's multiple. I mean, I'm, I'm sure in, in New Jersey is there a state association? Yep. So yeah, get involved in chapter. Get involved in your state association. Take part in opening new houses. Just just jump in. It would be my best advice. Yeah. Get with me after we're done, and I will share the uh, Simon Sinek leadership video with you right after this. Yeah, so um, I wanted to uh, go back to the uh, learning and telling part. At some point, um, you know, there have been situations where we've went into a house chapter, uh, so on and so forth, to teach them to do a certain thing, right? Um, and then it, you know, 
I always tell when I go there, hey, I'll show you how to do this. If you have any questions, let me know, right? <clears throat> At some point, when do you uh, recognize that what you're doing is, in, is enabling that person because they're, they're, they're I want to say they, they seem to not be learning what you're teaching them and they're expecting you to come and just do it. You know what I mean? Like, and I know that, you know, you said like, you know, a lot of us say, I'm just going to do it because I'm quicker, right? But on the same token for the ones that don't do that and we're actually, hey, this is how you fill this out. This is how you do this. And then they call you next week or next month. Hey, how do you do this? You know what I mean? Like, when do you get to a point as a leader to recognize that and how do you uh, deal with that? So I'll tell you for... <laughs> they just look at me and shake their head. Uh, I have like a mathematical system in my head. This is just me personally. Um, when we start working with a house, uh, whether it's going in and, and starting from scratch because it's a brand new house that we're opening and we have some core members coming in or it's a house that maybe needed some assistance um, to get you know strengthen what they have going on, um, it's this... Initially, it's me showing you, right? That might be week one, week two. Then week three, I'm like, all right, you show me. Right? That might be week three, week four, week five. Then week six, I'm like, well, why don't you do it, and I'll just look over it. Right. That's week seven, week eight. Then I get to a point where I'm like, I'm not coming. Okay. Right? But I'll, but I'll check in. How'd it go? What went right? What went wrong? Uh, you know, what do we need to work on? Um, I don't like, I don't want to just do for you, right? It's that whole ideology of I'm not going to keep feeding you. I'm going to teach you how to fish. Uh, same thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question. Uh, it's not sort of a statement. It's not actually a question. Excuse me. My name is Zeke. I'm from Washington, D.C. It's more of a statement. I was blessed to take psychology and sociology in school when I was younger. And it's about learning how to talk to people because you have a lot of different personalities. This one may flick, this one may not, this one may re re recede, whatever, get into his own shell. And I've learned to, in my way of thinking, if you learn how to talk to people, you can actually get them to do almost anything you want them to do. It's like you have to tell them, excuse my language, to kiss your ass in such a way they look forward to the trip. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way I look at people and the way I talk to people. That's what I like to do. All right, we're going to cut it off there. If you don't have anything else, you can get with uh, the people on the panel, maybe in the hallway at some point, or with your local outreach worker. Thank you, guys. Thank you.